everybody. Today we're going to talk about module 20, which is the basic learning concepts and classical conditioning. This is actually kind of cool because we all are influenced by a lot of these things and oftentimes we don't realize it. So how do we learn other than through language and words? So two ways. A, we learn through experience and B, we learn through association. So when we learn to predict events we don't already like or don't like by noticing other events or sensations that happened first. We learn through experience when our actions have consequences. That's why we um, engage in reward and, and punishment. And when we watch what other people do, so that's called you know, vicarious learning. So that's how kids learn oftentimes by watching how other kids play. We also learn by association. So when two events or sensations or stimuli occur together or in sequence, when actions become associated with pleasant or aversive results, and when two pieces of information are linked together. So there are three types of learning. The first is classical conditioning in which we are um, learning to link to stimuli in a way that helps us to anticipate an event in which we have a reaction and we'll explain what that means. Operation, op, sorry, operant conditioning is changing behavior choices in response to consequences. So this is a lot of kind of the, the behaviorism stuff that we do with our kids and with your dogs. And then cognitive learning is acquiring new behaviors and information through observation and information rather than by direct experience. This is by reading things or by observing things and then learning that way. So associative learning is classical conditioning. So how it works is after repeated exposure to two stimuli occurring in sequence, we associate those stimuli with each other. So that results in our natural response to one stimuli now being triggered by a new um, predictive stimulus. So, you know, when we see lightning, we now, or sorry, when we hear thunder, we now expect to see lightning. So as you said here, see lightning, hear thunder. So here our response to thunder becomes associated with lightning. So after repetition, the stimulus is we see lightning and the response is we cover our ears to avoid the sound. Um, operant conditioning is when we use uh, reinforcement or punishment. So a child learns to associate his response or his behavior with consequences. And child, children learn to repeat behaviors like saying please, which are followed by desirable results, such as giving, having, a, getting a cookie. They learn to avoid behaviors like yelling gimme, um, which are followed by undesirable results like scolding or loss of dessert. So being polite and then rewarding, and then you get a repeat of the behavior. And I have to tell you, um, across the board, reinforcement works much better than punishment. Um, so cognitive learning refers to acquiring new behaviors and information mentally rather than by direct experience. So it occurs by observing events and behavior of other people and by using language to acquire information about events experienced by others. So what you're doing right now by listening to me is cognitive learning. So you're learning about different constructs by listening and observing. So behaviorism was first used by John Watson in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and he was a proponent of classical conditioning. Um, he's the one on the right, and then B.F. Skinner, the one with the funny looking head, is the one um, on the left. And he was in the leader in the research on operant conditioning. He did a lot of work with pigeons, and then later um, he started Walden's a World, which was kind of like a commune that was based on the principles of operant conditioning. Both scientists believe that the mental life was much less important than behavior as a foundation for psychological science. So this was kind of a change. So this is like in response to Freudianism where he had all the unconscious kind of things going on. These guys felt that couldn't be studied and really talked about behavioral principles. Um, it was kind of a change in the, in the way that people thought about things. And both foresaw applications in controlling um, human behavior. So Skinner conceived of utopian communities and Watson went into advertising because we know that by using behaviorism we can influence people's marketing decisions. What I kind of find most um, fascinating when we talk about behaviorism are Ivan Pavlov's discoveries. So while studying salivation in dogs, Ivan Pavlov found that salivation from eating food was eventually triggered by what should have been a neutral stimulus, like just seeing the food. So when he presented the food, he noticed that the dogs already started salivating. Even seeing the dish that the food was supposed to be located in started the dog salivating. And then eventually even seeing the person that brought the dish which contained the food would start the dog salivating. And then even before that, hearing the person's footsteps. So what he did was he paired a neutral stimulus, so a stimulus which shouldn't trigger a salivation response, like ringing of a bell, um, which when not paired with anything really wouldn't cause the dog to salivate because he wouldn't associate the bell with food. 
But then, um, before conditioning, you have the unconditional stimulus and response. Is this, and the unconditioned stimulus is a stimulus which triggers a response naturally before, without any conditioning. So in this case, the unconditioned stimulus is the presentation of food, and the unconditioned response is the dog salivating. Um, it would be, for example, seeing, um, you know, if you're a male, seeing an attractive female, and then the, uh, that would be unconditional stimulus, and then the unconditioned response would be feeling aroused. So these are things that we can't really control. These are our biological urges. But then during conditioning, we would pair the neutral stimulus repeatedly with the unconditioned stimulus. So you would pair the bell, which is the neutral stimulus, with the food, which is the unconditional stimulus. So every time you bring food, you would ring the bell. So then, um, Obviously, we still get the unconditioned response because you're still presenting the food. So what happens then is after conditioning, when the bell rings, you automatically st the dog starts salivating upon hearing the tone. So it's now a conditioned stimulus, which was before neutral stimulus, and now causes the dog to salivate. So the bell has now been paired with food. So um, the, the unconditioned response and the conditioned response are the same response triggered by different events. The difference is whether conditioning was necessary for the response to happen. So first, um, the unconditioned response was um, in response to the food, but then it becomes conditioned in response to the bell. The neutral stimulus and the, uh, the conditioned stimulus are the same stimulus. Um, the difference is whether the stimulus triggers the conditioned response or not. So we have the, be the bell is always ringing, but then it, depending on whether it was paired with the food or not, which is the unconditioned um, stimulus that get the conditioned response. I know that seems a little bit complicated. You can go over that in your book. Um, the language is a little bit complicated, but when you think about it in terms of the bell and pairing with the food, it makes a lot of sense. So higher order conditioning. So if the dog becomes conditioned to salivate at the sound, sound of the bell, can the dog be conditioned to salivate when a light flashes by associating it with the bell instead of with food? Yes. So because now the bell is associated with the food, which then results in salivation, if we start pairing the bell with the light, the light alone, without the food, the light alone will trigger the conditioned response, which is the salivation. This is called higher order conditioning. When you turn a neutral stimulus in a condition, into a conditioned stimulus by associating it with another conditioned stimulus. So a man who is conditioned to associate joy with coffee could then learn to associate joy with a restaurant if he was served coffee there every time he walked into the restaurant. So um, that's also when they talked about the footsteps and the person you know, bringing the food, so those were higher level conditioning. So when we talk about learning, there, there are different phases. So acquisition refers to the initial stage of learning or conditioning. So that's when the association between the neutral stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus um, starts to, to transpire. So that's by pairing the, um, the, the bell with the food. So how can we tell that acquisition has occurred? So how do we know that the two have been paired? Now our unconditioned response gets triggered by a conditional stimulus so that the dog starts salivating when he hears the bell. So for the association to be acquired, the neutral stimulus needs to be repeat, repeatedly appear before the unconditional stimulus. So you always have to ring the bell before you present the food because that then shows the anticipation that the food is about to arrive. About a half a second before in most cases, so the timing is somewhat important. The bell must come right before the food, so there's a very strong association with that. Um, and then the strength of the conditioned response grows with conditioning. So initially it's not so strong, but then um, when the, you continuously pair the two, the, the, the response becomes very strong. We can then extinguish the response of the neutral stimulus by um, pairing the conditioned stimulus, the bell, um, with, without showing food. So if you continue to ring the bell and then never give the dog any food, eventually the dog will stop salivating to the bell because he's kind of come to learn that the bell doesn't mean anything anymore. You can then change this um, if you start pairing it with food again. So after salivation has been conditioned and then extinguished, if you give a rest period, so if you don't do it for a while, um, then the, the presentation of the bell alone might lead to spontaneous recovery. So if we give it a break, the dog might start salivating a, a little bit, but then uh, eventually again realizes that when it's not presented with food, it's not gonna you know, make, cause them to salivate anymore. So generalization and discrimination. Um, so Ivan Pavlov conditioned dogs to drool when rubbed and then also drooled when scratched.
he also conditioned um, dogs to drool at bells of certain pitch and slightly different pitches did not trigger drooling. So you can see how much, um, you know, so when he kind of rubbed them, they would, you know, um, that was okay and then he could scratch them and they would still drool, but that they were very much attuned to the different pitches. So generalization refers to the tendency to have conditioned responses triggered by related stimuli. So for example, in this case, um, the rubbing and the scratching were similar enough that they elicited drooling. Um, so more stuff can make you drool. Um, but it can all discrimination refers to the ability to respond only to a specific stimuli preventing generalization. So less stuff makes you drool. So there are various ways we can we can train people. So Ivan Pavlov had kind of a long legacy, and that's why we're still talking about his research today because it's pretty seminal in terms of you know understanding learning principles. So he talked about insights about conditioning in general that it occurs in all creatures and it's related to biological drives and responses like I mentioned with the sexual urges, eating, sleeping, things like that. It also provided insight about science so it showed us that learning can be studied objectively by quantifying actions and isolating elements of behavior. So this is relatively new because a lot of the stuff with Freud, you know, talking about the unconscious and the id and the ego and all that stuff couldn't be studied and it wasn't quantifiable. So this is a new way of studying our behavior. And then we got insights from specific applications. So substance abuse involves um, conditioned triggers. So for example, going into a bar causes people to have the urge to drink alcohol or being around people who you drink with causes you to want to drink alcohol. And these triggers like places or events can be avoided and associated with new responses. So John Watson, um, we, learned, we talked about him at the beginning of the lecture, was um, the key figures in behaviorism. And we talked about him a Earlier in the semester, we talked about um, you know him inducing the little fear in baby Albert. So, in 1929, month-old little Albert was not afraid of rats. So John Watson and Rosalie Rayner then clanged a steel bar every time a rat was presented to little Albert, and therefore Albert um, acquired a fear of rats and generalized this fear to other soft and furry things. So by pairing a very aversive noise um, with the rat, uh, it made little Albert afraid. He didn't like the noise and then when the noise was paired with the rat, seeing the rat now made him kind of feel uh, scared and then anything that was soft and furry became aversive to him. This today would not be acceptable because you're inducing fears in children. So Watson prided himself in his ability to shape people's emotions and then as we mentioned earlier he went into advertising. So just to give you kind of the, the language here, before conditioning the rat was a neutral stimulus and little Albert was not afraid of him. Then they paired an unconditioned stimulus, which is the clanging and the really loud noise, which would make the baby cry. And his natural response, which was the conditioned stimulus, was that, or the unconditional, uh, unconditional response, or the UCR, is, is fear and crying. So during conditioning, the neutral stimulus is paired with the unconditional stimulus, which resulted in the crying. And then after conditioning, the neutral stimulus now becomes a conditioned stimulus and um, then every time he saw the rat, he